Hi, I'm George. It's been a while since we've done our last update. Welcome back. Uh, now, because of the shutdowns, progress on the Horizon project's been a little slow, but we have been doing some things. Uh, and so in this video, we're going to show you what we've done and also talk about some of the other projects we've been working on. So let's jump straight into it. In the last video, we finished the major components of the launcher, but the base frame still needed painting. We marked all the ends with the center punch so that we could paint over it and still know where things go. The blue primer paint on the frame was the original coating that the RHS came with, but all the welds were still raw steel, so we needed to paint them anyway. We gave everything a couple of coats of the rust guard paint, since this frame is going to see a bit of moisture in the field. The brackets also get a couple of coats of paint. The next day when the paint had dried, we capped the ends of the RHS with these plastic caps. This stops dirt and water getting in while we're out at the launch site. So the base frame is now complete. Now one of the reasons we've slowed down in our development is because our lathe stopped working. As you probably noticed in the last video and in this one, the lathe is not here. That's over at dad's place so that he could machine during isolation. Uh, while it was there, um, the lathe had broke down so we brought it back here to try and repair. Um, it's back over at dad's now. So uh, here's a video of what we did to repair it. Now we turn the power on. Okay, so normally the way this would be turned to zero and we would turn on, then increase the speed. So let's have a look, see if this will blow the fuse. We are also watching the spindle. And here we go. And spins up the motor, blows the fuse. Okay, so instead of the motor, we have hooked up a light to 40 volt in canvas and bulb. And so the only thing that's disconnected, disconnected at the moment is the motor. So we go forward, light turns on, I'm not sure if that's what should be happening. We increase the speed, light gets brighter, decrease the speed. Reversing the current. So here I'm thinking that perhaps the controller is fine because the fuse doesn't blow when the motor is disconnected. Maybe one of the motor windings is shorted. So I pull the motor out and just run it off a battery. So it's showing current. It's a 240 volt DC motor and here I'm just powering it from 24 volts. That 120 milliamps. Let's reverse polarity. Again, about 120 milliamps. Apply a bit of load. Oh. So it seems to be running okay. So it must be the controller board after all. In hindsight, when I turned it on during testing, the light bulb should have been off. Okay, it's been a couple of weeks since we last looked at this. Now we're going to put the motor back in. And that board we're going to replace with this one that we just received from China. Okay, so this is tricky. This to go in like this. The whole motor is on a pivot to allow you to tension the belt. And then the back cover goes on. We then reconnect the motor back into the control panel. So now we'll start transferring those to the new board one at a time. Now 
it is very slightly different. This one has a, a diode here, whereas this one doesn't. Uh, but from what I've seen, it's still for exactly the same. This is just a newer version. All right, let's do it. We're very carefully moving one wire at a time from one board to the other, so we don't get them mixed up, though they're pretty well labeled. This board is out. And with that, we have a new board now. Let's double check. And then we'll power it up. Okay, so now the moment of truth. Did we fix it? I'll plug it in. All right, we have no power. Okay, we have no power because the fuse was completely crispied in there. Last fuse. Let's try that again, huh? Plug it back in. Power. All right, we've got some lights. Do we dare spin it up? So we're at zero speed. Forward. We have a working lathe. Try reverse. So we took the lathe back to dad's place so he could continue to machine parts. We don't have any video of him machining, but he did take a few photos as he was going. The main thing he machined were three nozzles and a spare one for the boosters. They were machined from this big chunk of aluminium bar that we had. Here the surface has a few notches cut into it to better adhere to the carbon fibre composite within which these will be embedded. He then also machined a test adapter that we'll use in an upcoming pressure test of a prototype pressure chamber. The nozzle for this test pressure chamber is made of brass since weight really isn't an issue. The nozzles themselves are made of aluminium so that we could machine them to the exact tolerances that they need and they'll also form the smooth sealing surface for the o-rings. Dad was even so bored that he machined this jig to make it easier to slide the o-rings onto the launch tubes. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the design issues we're looking at with the booster itself. Now we've got a pretty good idea how to make the pressure chambers. They'll follow a very similar process to what we did for the last sustainer. Uh, they'll just be bigger diameter. Uh, but how do all of those three different segments uh, fit together? Uh, that's what we'll have a look at in this video. Here's a CAD model of the booster. The main point where the booster segments are joined together is through six brackets at the central staging mechanism right here. These brackets will be made from carbon fiber. Now this connection has to be very strong because the entire booster is held down through this one connection. Each bracket has to hold about 100 kilos or 1000 newtons of force. It also has to support the weight of the sustainer during acceleration. The big question is how will this affect the integrity of a fully pressurized pressure chamber when you're applying these point loads to it. We are likely to add reinforcement bands around the pressure chamber at these locations. The central point is not going to be enough to hold the entire booster together and we have to also join the segments at the top and the bottom. Let's start with the bottom bracing. On the Acceleron 5 rocket, we had a plate at the bottom that joined the three segments together and this is where the hold down point was as well. On Horizon, the hold down point is all the way up at the staging mechanism, so the bracing has to be different. We are likely to have just carbon fiber plates around the bottom like this. This will give the launcher's release head enough clearance to emerge during launch. We are still trying to decide what we're going to do about the top of the rocket. We need to brace the three segments together to support the sustainer. If we don't support the segment somehow, they can splay open and the sustainer could be pushed to one side under acceleration. On the Acceleron booster, we did this by adding a ring around the segments. 
This holds the segments together and provides enough clearance for the sustainer fins when the sustainer is released. We thought we'd take a similar approach with this rocket, and we even 3D printed a ring that may work, though we would wrap it in carbon fibre to give us the stiffness and strength we need. Alternatively, we could have something a little smaller that still gives us clearance, but is made of individual segments, like the ones at the base. An alternative that our friend George had suggested was to just attach three little clips to the sustainer that hook into slots on each of the segments. During the release of the sustainer, the clips just slip out of their respective slots. This approach has several advantages like keeping everything together and nice and straight. It is low drag and lightweight. We're happy to hear suggestions in the comments about alternative approaches we could take. The next issue is parachute deployment. We will again have the twin and independent parachutes like we did with the Acceleron 5 for redundancy. We are going with side deployment because the nose cones have to be very strong and permanently mounted. This is because the water coming out of the sustainer can exert a lot of force, as we found during a previous launch that bent this aluminium plate on the launcher. If we had loose nose cones that eject inline, the jet of water hitting them could be an issue so they will be securely attached and reinforced. The other advantage of side deployment here is that the parachute is ejected clear to the side where it's less likely to get tangled than if it was ejected forward and then the chute could come back and get caught in the middle of the booster. Parachute attachment points will be the same like on the Acceleron booster and the rocket will come down sideways. This is so we create more drag with the rocket on the way down and we protect the nozzles from impacting the ground directly. The parachute will be attached here and here. This puts the main shock cord slightly forward of the center of gravity because the fins will generate a certain amount of lift as the rocket comes down. If you suspended it at the center of gravity, it would come down with the nose pointing down. The parachutes will also have a tendency to push apart like we've seen before, and this will create more stable booster on the way down. We're going to point one of the fins straight down and this will take the first impact. This should minimize the bending force on the fin fillet. If we were to land the rocket with two fins pointing to the sides, then there is a higher chance that we could break off a fin because the bending force on the fillet is much higher. We'll talk about the deployment mechanism and fins in more detail in upcoming videos. So those are some of the issues we're looking at before we start the majority of the construction. Another project we've been working on is we've always wanted to have more time-lapse capability than the GoPro that we've been using. The problem with this, it's got a fairly wide angle lens and so it's kind of limited in terms of what we can do with it. Uh, we wanted to have uh, our still camera, uh, Nikon D3400, uh, for some of those shots. The only problem is it doesn't come with a time-lapse function and you can't buy intervalometers for it. Uh, the only thing it has is a simple infrared remote control uh, shutter release. Um, so we decided to build our own. And so let's have a look how that works. The remote is based around a Pro Micro, an Arduino based controller. We soldered that to a prototype board so that we could attach a set of buttons and also fitted it with one of these OLED displays that we bought on eBay for three bucks. These are nice and bright and visible in daylight. Then we printed a case for the whole thing so we could hold a battery as well. And here it is mounted inside of the case. That's the Pro Micro, and here's the infrared LED. And we also have a second infrared LED on a separate wire. We just have a couple of screws holding the whole case together. Okay, so these are the control options you have. In shutter mode, you can just use it as a simple remote. Every time you press the button, it takes a picture. It also counts the number of pictures you've taken. Here we're using it just like a remote shutter. In time-lapse mode, you have a little more info. Here's the delay that it sets to, and here's the countdown until the next picture. Then you have the running time for the video at the given frame rate, and that's followed by the number of frames taken. We have a standard mounting thread on the bottom so that we can attach it to a hot shoe mount like this. and then we can point the LED at the sensor. Here it is running the time-lapse function. Okay. Over here, it's telling you that so far you have 0.2 seconds of a video shot at 25 frames per second. 
you can pause it at any time if needed. In delay mode, you can set it to take a single shot after a certain amount of time. And then in the settings mode, you can change any of the configuration parameters. Here is the delay, or the frames per second, or duration. You can then go in and change the values. Once you set the value, you can then exit, and the settings get stored internally for next time. And then you can go back into the mode you want and start again. And something we didn't have before is time-lapse with a flash. Well, that's a bit of a mixed bag. We hope to get back into more regular updates uh, every couple of weeks. Uh, we're also hoping that launches will start up again, uh, probably towards the end of July, uh, depending on how the restrictions are lifted. Uh, and there might also be a chance of a high power launch uh, in September. Uh, so we're hoping that will come off as well. Uh, and I also wanted to give a big shout out to the UTS rocketry team. Uh, we had a great Zoom meeting all about water rockets and hopefully maybe one or two will have a go at building them as well. So anyway, that's all for this week. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.